Hey guys, uh, we are back and we're going to talk about vectors. So we've finished off with our sort of basics of measurement. We have a lab on measurement today, so we'll, don't worry if you're, if you're sad that we're done with measurement. There's plenty more where that came from. Um, so let's talk about vectors. Um, we, we're starting with our coordinate systems and we have our standard Cartesian coordinate system. Um, how many of you have taken linear algebra? A couple, okay. Uh, so you understand like like uh, orthog the orthogonality and like how you can have linear combinations of things. Uh, if when you, this is going to be important to you later if, when you when and if you do take linear algebra. Um, so basically, we end up having equations for each dimension, right? So if you have like x, y, and z, if you have a three-dimensional variable, you have you can break it down into the part of this that's in the x direction, the part of this that's in the y direction, and the part of it that's in the z direction. It ends up being important that these are orthogonal or perpendicular to each other because that's what makes it okay for you to do those things, and that's what makes them different equations, okay? And so you can treat all motion, um, like in any coordinate system with perpendicular axes, you can break all motion into the different axes, okay? So, uh, for Cartesian, that's just x, y. Oh, good. It's the same slide, and I animated it, and it's going to take forever. Um, so for cylindrical, that's r, theta, and z. And for spherical, that's rho, theta, and phi. So we mostly only work in here, but we do use some polar and cylindrical coordinates when we talk about circular motion, so it's worth knowing about. And we don't deal with spherical, really, until we get to the next semester. So if you're worried about that, you'll probably get to go over it in the next calculus class. If you're not there yet, don't worry yet, okay? Um, you can also map all of these onto each other. Uh, there's a fun thing called the Jacobian that can do that. It's useful for doing that, when, and you'll learn it in math. And we don't really need to know that for this, but it is a cool thing. So vectors are special numbers because they also have a direction. And we've talked a little bit about this, but we're going to go into more detail. Um, but the nice thing about that is if you put a, d a vector in three-dimensional space, you can break it into x, y, and z, right? And what we mean by break it into x, y, and z is the way that you add up vectors, you can basically decompose the vector into three components, all right? And all of those components are perpendicular to each other, so that means they all behave separately, okay? Um, so we can, we say vectors can be broken into orthogonal, which just means perpendicular, component vectors, all right? And a component vector is just a vector that you add to the other components to make up the whole thing. What this means is basically for every equation you get, you can have two or three equations that are basically identical. So for if you have one equation, you also have it in X and you have it in Y and you have it in Z, okay? Um, so... Uh, the nice thing about vectors, though, is they don't stick to a particular point. A vector really just describes a length and a direction. So you can move it all over in space. It doesn't actually matter. Um, and they only need to maintain this angle, right? So if you have uh, a perpendicular, if you, sorry, if you have a, a line here, a reference line, it's always going to have the same angle and it's always going to have the same length. Um, a vector really is a magnitude and a direction. It looks like it's existing in space, but really it's just telling you the magnitude and direction at one point, okay? This arrow is just a visual cue. It doesn't actually, it's not like there's vectors just like sticking out in real life, okay? So it's just a way of keeping track of a number and a direction. Um, this would be like a velocity vector. I'll, you'll notice I, the book and I, make all of our velocity vectors green, all of our position vectors blue, and all of our acceleration vectors orange, and then we get to forces, those are red. So if you want to keep track of all that stuff, I tried to be consistent with the book in case, in case you read it, um, which some people actually do. So addition with vectors, well, vectors are great for com combining something we call a displacement, okay? A displacement is really a final position minus an initial position. And that's how you know what the direction is. So like, for instance, if I walk from here to here, my displacement is this position minus that position in this direction, OK? So um, if, if you have like a Roomba, for instance, and it goes like this, its path looks like this. But that, and you can represent that with two vectors. 
but its displacement is actually just its final position minus its, its initial position. So displacement is not quite the same as distance traveled, okay? Displacement has a specific definition. It's just connecting the dots between your final spot and your initial spot, all right? Okay, uh, let's do a quicker question. What is a vector quantity? Which things have direction? So we think acceleration, position, and speed are all maybe vectors. So let's discuss this and we'll vote again. <laughs> That's better-ish. D, yeah, okay. Um, oh, well, I guess that's just a definition problem. So, uh, at your age, we've decided not a vector, right? Because, I mean, although there is a direction of time, it's kind of more abstract. Uh, acceleration is actually definitely a vector. Acceleration, um, the difference between acceleration and deceleration is really which way the vector's pointing compared to the direction of motion. So, that has to be a vector. Position, how many points does position have? One. So how could you know what, like if you're standing here, how can there be a direction if you don't have any motion? Okay, so position, not a vector. Speed, this one's tricky. Velocity is a vector. Speed is just the number, right? So speed is like 20 miles per hour. Velocity would be 20 miles per hour east, right? So that's a subtle definition. We haven't been over that yet, so it's okay if you didn't get that yet, all right? But there are certain quantities in physics that are vectors and some that are not. And it's important to know which ones are which because the math changes depending on whether or not they are. Also, your answer has to include things like direction if it's a vector. Okay, so just conceptually adding up vectors, um, you kind of just do this kind of, it's, it looks dumb, right? You put them tip to tail and then you connect to the dots, right? Um, or you can add them up like this. There's two methods. This is just the tip to tail method. So it's like connect the dots, draw a line, you're good. Uh, this is the parallelogram method, which is you draw a line parallel to D, you draw a line parallel to E, and where they cross, that's where your new vector ends up, okay? Uh, luckily for us, most of the vectors we deal with end up, we either make them perpendicular to each other or they um, start out perpendicular and we add them back together. So everything we do is right triangles. Yes? Are you going to have this lecture posted on Canvas? It's currently posted on Canvas. Okay. Yeah. The module, right? Yeah, there's a module. It's, it's like the, there's an intro module right now and then there's one other module and it's just all of these. So it has the videos that we got, like of all the content we got through, through Tuesday. Um, I'll have the ones for, obviously I'm recording these now, so I have some of these recorded from previously, but there's holes in them, so I'm sort of posting the videos as I record them live, so the, the poor online people have a slight delay um, in what, when they're getting their videos, but I don't think they'll care, I'll just move their tests and stuff back. So you guys are just ahead of the game. Um, you're getting the, the fresh content. Um, yeah, so all of the, the lecture notes are posted online. They're posted as a PDF, so they're easy to download. Although I think this slide looks particularly stupid because it has the like first, it has like all the animations rendered on top of each other, which looks dumb, so I apologize. Um, but uh, for the most part, it has all the stuff. Also has all the videos, like all the stuff we've talked about in class is broken down into little chunks of video so you can go back and review it. They will be both in Canvas so you can get credit for watching them. Since you guys are here in person, I'll waive the necessity to do that. So I'll, I'll just add in points for you even if you don't watch the videos. Um, if you wanna watch the videos without having to do the embedded quizzing, I'll soon have my YouTube playlist up so you can just start scrolling through them. And then if you wanna go back and review stuff or study, that'll be on there too. Um, some of the problems that we don't do in class, I may go home, or if you, there's a problem like I don't like the way it's done in class, I'll redo it in more detail. And you'll notice when the problems show up in the videos, there's little, um, you'll see when you do the first homework, I have a, a way of doing problems, like a, some visual cues for like which step you're on. And in the videos, those same icons show up when we get to that part of the problem so that you can practice seeing how you set up problems and how you solve. Okay, so there's a lot of extra stuff in the videos that we don't have in class because you have to just listen to my words and I can only do so much, but in the post-production, I add in a few things. Okay, any other questions about that? Perfect. 
So here's a clicker question. Um, what's the answer? Okay, so we're thinking B, C, D, or E. Please discuss and vote again. Huh, enough people. Okay. Ooh, much better. See, this is what we like to see. <laughs> now we're getting closer to the right answer. Um, okay, uh, so there's a couple different ways to do this visually. So how many of you like are really good at visualizing stuff in your head? How many of you are really bad at visualizing stuff in your head? Okay, that sucks. Um, yeah, but the thing is brains are all different, so you have to find a strategy that works for you. And I'm going to show you a couple different ways you can think about this. So first, the first one, which is what I would do, which is, doesn't mean it's correct, is I would shift this down here, and you know it's subtracting. Since they're parallel, that makes this about half the length. Now if you use the parallelogram method, that points like this, okay? There's also, um, let's see, there's also this. Um, you could do two parallelogram methods and put them together, okay? But either one is fine. Um, you can also just add them all tip to tail in any order that you want. It'll all give you the same answer. So being able to, to see things in your head um, is great, but if you can't, you can use the math part. Okay, so let's talk about vector multiplication by a scalar. We're also going to talk about multiplying vectors together, which gets a little bit more complicated. But really, um, we have these things called unit vectors. And is everybody, who is not familiar with what a unit vector is? Oh, you guys have all seen it. Good. OK. So the key, this is a really key point in unit vectors. Once you have a vector, it gives you a particular direction. A unit vector is something with a length of one that points in a particular direction. So the nice thing about scalar multiplication is it just makes the vector longer. It doesn't change the direction, just the length. And anything multiplied by one is itself. So a unit vector is a great way of keeping track of directions without having to keep track of the number. Um, but so for instance, if we have a vector A, if we multiply it by two, it's just twice as long, all right? What happens if we multiply it by three? It's three times as long. And if we have this one that's pointing in this other direction, we multiply it by four. It's parallel to the original vector, but it's four times as long. Okay? Okay. Um, the other thing is same direction just means same angle from any reference point. So it would just be, it also means that they're parallel. Uh, slight side note, um, zero vectors, right? Multiplication by a zero um, gives a zero vector denoted by zero. Okay? Uh, which is really hard to draw. Try drawing something with a length of zero. It doesn't work. Um, subtraction is like, just like in regular subtraction, is just addition with negatives. So you'd multiply uh, Q by a negative one, which would flip the direction, and then you would just add them normally. So you could do it like this. Um, you could also use the parallelogram method. All of that works, okay? All right, we have another clicker question. Okay, we've got a big spread, so please discuss and we'll vote again. Ah, much better. So we think the answer is A. Does anyone want to talk about why? No, you just, you just know that? Well, why is it A? Why is it A? Yeah, it was. I mean, okay. I um, so it's 2A, so this has to be twice as long, right? So this becomes twice as long, and then you subtract B, so you have to flip B around, okay? So, let's see, let's probably draw it on the board. Um, so 2A should look like this, and then B is going to point up like this, okay? You're just flop, flop, flopping B over, and then you connect the dots. So that should look roughly like A. B is like, almost as good an answer because you probably have to get better precision for angles in your head than you have. So A and B, both pretty good. All of these really freaking wrong. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So vector addition. Um, let's say we have a whole bunch of vectors uh, and our Roomba is like really, I was really, I had a new Roomba when I made these slides, so I was pretty excited about it. Um, I like how it makes sad sounds when it gets stuck. But anyway, uh, so you can add them tip to tail. 
how useful is this if you need a number? Not super useful, right? So even though you can get the net displacement visually and you get the concept, if you want to know the actual length of that vector, not super nice. So what we end up doing is we worry about the components of the vector for two reasons. One, because it's easier to add vectors just in general. And two, because when we start talk, talking about vectors for motion, we want to do all of the motion on the x-axis, all of the motion on the y-axis, and all of the motion on the z-axis separately, because it's simpler mathematically, and then we want to put them back together. Okay, That's how we do kinematics. That's how we do tracking motion and predicting motion. So um, component vectors are the projections along the x and y-axis. So for instance, if we want to break this down into an x component and a y component, it looks something like this. So this would be your y component. It's parallel to the y axis. This is your x component. It's parallel to the x axis. And if you add up the two components, what do you get? This, right? Because you could say, OK, ax plus ay gives you a. So you can break it down into x and y, and then you can put it back together. You don't lose anything, OK? Um, so, if you wanted to do this and actually get a number, you could break, and, and this, is, this is really just like theoretical, we're not, I'm not going to make you do this in the homework or anything, but you could break all of these into x and y components. If you can see, this one has an x component, this one has a y component, right? And you could do that for all of them, and then you can move these all over onto the axis. Because once vectors are parallel, you can add them like numbers, right? If you have... 3 plus 2, that's not going to give you 5. But if you have 3 plus 2 and they're parallel, that gives you 5. Okay? So as long as your vectors are along the same axis, then you can just use regular addition and subtraction. So that's super convenient. Um, and if you add up all of the vectors, you end up with something like this. So we broke them all down into x and y, added up all the x's, added up all the y's. We end up with these two vectors. And that means our final displacement vector now we know how to actually calculate it with numbers because all of these, once you break down all these, they should all have their own number. They all have their own direction. And how would you get this? If you have this and this, this is going to be the hypotenuse, right? Do we know how to find a hypotenuse of a right triangle? Yes, okay. So there's going to be a, lo there's a lot of tangents, sines, and cosines, and then there's a lot of Pythagorean theorem when we're going back and forth between vector components and actual vectors. So, the way you want to think about this is if you break down a vectors into their components, you get this nice right triangle where this is the x component and this is the y component. In case you didn't see a triangle, here is a visual cue that this is a triangle. Okay? Um, if you want to find, oops, I was going to ask you that, but if you want to, oh no, why would I do that? If you want to figure out what the length of this is and you know this length and the angle, Right? This would be, if this is your angle, this is the adjacent side of your triangle. So that's going to be cosine. Then if you want to find this side, you can do a sine of this angle for this side. Okay? Um, really, like, I think we're used to in Sokotoa. Right? So, Toa. You end, you, you, we're used to doing um, sine theta is equal to uh, opposite over hypotenuse, right? right? In this class, what we usually end up with is um, opposite is equal to hypotenuse sine theta. Just one step of algebra, but just in case you're more familiar with this, this is what we end up using. So in this case, right, this would be um, a and this is a y. So that means a y is equal to a sine theta. Okay? Just to map it to what the way that math is normally taught. Um, so yeah, so we have sine and cosine of theta. It matters where theta is. We're calling this theta in this case. I should have probably drawn it in, but it's not. So um, oh there it is. <laughs> if you want to go back, let's say you have ax and ay. How can you figure out the length of a? Pythagorean theorem, right? So you do this. How, if you only know these two things, how can you figure out this angle? 
Inverse something. Which which one? <laughs> you have three choices. It's sine, cosine, or tangent. We already used sine and cosine. It's tangent. You guys are so good at trig. Okay, so if you want to do tangent, it's just opposite over adjacent, right? So that would be this one. That's the opposite side from the angle over adjacent. So tangent inverse ay over ax, okay? So this is what I meant when I said we're going to be using Sokotoa a lot. Um, cool. We're going to do a problem. I'm going to give you a, just a couple minutes to work on this because we're... I think we're going to, I want to make sure we finish all these slides and then I'll go over it with you. But try setting it up. Um, so you're really just finding the x and y components of the acceleration vector. It doesn't really matter that it's an acceleration vector, except you'll need to make sure you keep units. Okay, so you can see what I'm doing. Good. So how would we draw the components? There's a couple different ways, right? We want it to look like a triangle. Um, so let's start by drawing this guy. Okay, is this the x or the y component? X component. So we'll call this a x. And then we'll have um, also a y component. And we'll call this a y. Okay. Um, if you want to draw this one over here, you can do that too. using the cool features of this. Um, so now, yeah, you can see that it looks like a triangle, okay? I drew it slightly crooked, but you'll have to trust me that it's a right triangle, okay? So here we have our right angle, sort of, right here. Um, this is going to be our angle 30 degrees. So if we want to write out AX, how would we write that? We start with A, right? That's our hypotenuse. Is it sine or cosine? Oh, cosine. Cosine, right? This is the angle, so this is the adjacent side. So that's going to be cosine of theta, okay? If we want to plug in our numbers, also, which direction is this pointing? Negative. Negative. So because we're using 30, right, we're not doing the whole unit circle thing, you have to just see that it's negative. Otherwise, you're going to have to, what angle would it be if you want to actually preserve the like math part. Yeah, it'd be like 210, right? If you plug in cosine of 210, it'll give you a negative number, but you can, since you can just look at it and find that it's negative, you can just do that. So we're going to call this negative um, A, which is 6.0 meters per second squared, um, cosine of 30 degrees. Remember, we put this negative in because we know it's pointed in the negative direction. Um, the a sub x indicates that's the x direction. You don't have to write it as a vector, but if you wanted to write it as a vector, you could write like an x hat or an i hat, depending on what notation you like the best. I don't really care which one you use, but that's a unit vector in the x direction. Okay, But it's, it's fine to assume that because it's written as a sub x, that means it's pointing in the x direction. All right? So we plug that in. Um, that's going to give us negative 5.2 times, uh, oh, not, no, there's no times, sorry. Too much scientific notation. Um, what are the units? Meters, squared. Meters per second squared, okay, because it's an acceleration. So that's our A sub X. For our A sub Y, hmm, can you see that yellow? Oh, good, okay. So for A sub Y, we're going to have A, this is our angle, it's over here. Is that sine or cosine? We already used cosine, so it's probably sine, yeah. Sine theta, okay. Um, is that going to be positive or negative in the y direction? Negative. negative, so we put the negative. Otherwise, we have to go back to the angle of 210, okay. So that's going to be 6.0 meters per second squared. Um, sorry. And then that's sine of 30 degrees. You can plug this into a calculator, and that's going to give you negative 3.0 meters per second squared. Okay, so these are our component vectors, um, and this is a sub y. So a sub y looks like negative 3, uh, a sub x looks like negative 5.2. They're negative because they're pointed in the negative direction on our 
coordinate system, okay? Because remember, we're just thinking of a regular x, y axis. So if we do that like this, right, x, y, this direction and this direction are positive, this direction and this direction are negative. That's all we're doing, okay? Any questions about this? Visually, is there a way to check if your answer makes sense? Yeah, if you draw out this triangle, which one's longer? A sub x, right? The x, the x one, this one, it, oops, oh, I just erased it. That's cool. Uh, this one is longer. So if you, got, if you mixed up your sine and cosine and you got three for that one and five for the other one, it might be worth checking that it's not matching up with what you see. Okay, so that's what I mean by guess which one's going to be bigger first. That one, when you get your answer, you know if you forgot how to do trig. Okay. Okay, we're mostly thinking D and Okay, much better. So the answer is D. It's pretty simple, right? You're just figuring out the triangle, so you'll need the distance along the the y-axis. So that's from 1 to negative 3. What's that length? Four. Negative four, okay, and then you need your distance along your x-axis, that's from negative one to one, so that should be two. positive two, okay? So our components are negative four and positive two. You just have to remember that we're looking at the absolute value, not like the position, okay? Okay, where did that go? Cool. Um, just a side note on unit vectors, which you guys seem to know about, but really a unit vector, unit when we talk about the unit circle, what's the radius of that circle? One. One. We talk about a unit vector, what's the length of that vector? One. one. Okay, unit in math is just one, just one unit of something. So um, for all of our unit vectors, uh, there's also a k hat if you want to go in the z direction, right? Um, you can also call, I like calling them x hat, y hat, and z hat because it's a lot more obvious that they're in the x, y, and z direction. That's more of a physics thing. Math likes i, j, and k. I don't exactly know why. It tends to be confusing if you have to use imaginary numbers or anything like that. But you can use whichever one you want. I know what both of them are, so if I'm looking through your stuff, I won't be confused. Um, unit vectors are really just indicating a direction. So anything you multiply them by, they'll keep the direction and then you don't have to worry about adding a direction. So they're really useful for indicating if something's in the x, y, or z direction. All right, cool. Um, a little side note on unit vectors. If you wanted to write this in unit vectors, how would you go about doing that? Well, you can break it into its components, right? Because this would be one in which direction? X. X, you would just call that x hat or i hat. And then you would have 2 in which direction? Y. y. So that would be 2j hat. So you could write it like this. Okay. Similarly, over here, this would be 2i hat minus uh, about 4j hat. Okay. Just make sure you keep the direction. Negatives indicate the up or down, left or right. Okay. All right. We've talked a lot about scalar multiplication, but it turns out vectors, if you don't multiply by a scalar and you multiply by another vector, things get complicated. And this comes up a lot more in the next semester because um, electric and magnetic fields tend to be perpendicular and they have shapes that are either spirally or like pointy. Uh, <laughs> when we get into three-dimensional vector math, there's, it's more like squishy definitions of like, what is the overall shape of a vector field, which is a really abstract thing. But generally, a dot product, right, a, which is called a scalar product, which is confusing, you're not multiplying by a scalar. Why is it called a scalar product? Well, it gives you a scalar. So this is a case where you multiply two vectors together and you get a scalar, okay? So you multiply two numbers with directions together and you get just a number, all right? So the dot product looks something like this. And really what that means is um, you're taking the projection of one vector onto another and then multiplying them together. So here you'd have like the projection of B on A and then they're parallel and then you can multiply them together, right? So over here, you could do it the other way. It works the same. It's, it's reciprocal. The crazy thing about the dot product is it's pretty much for measuring the parallelness of things, 
right? If something's completely perpendicular, what does the dot product give you? Zero, right? So the, the scalar product, um, you can see if, you, if it's an acute or ob obtuse angle, you get some in-between number. The maximum you can get is if these things are parallel, and you get zero if you're at 90 degrees. So if things are perpendicular, the dot product's gonna give you zero. If things are completely parallel, that is your maximum value, okay? So it's generally measuring the parallelness of two things, which we'll see matters when we start talking about something like work, okay? We, we pretty much in this class, we use this, we would use the dot product for work. And work is just the parallelness of a force and a displacement, and we'll get to that eventually. Um, this is a big math thing that we're never going to use, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, cross product's a little bit different. This is where you end up having to use the right-hand rule. There's a handedness, meaning like there's a particular direction that you get for your third vector. So this is when you multiply a vector and another vector and get a third vector, okay? Which gets real confusing. We're not going to use this till we get to torque, but for torque, you're, you're still, you still have a force and a displacement but you are me measuring how perpendicular they are, okay? So the more perpendicular things are, the more torque you have. And what, what, what I mean by that is like, if you open the door, do you wanna open it from the hinge or from the handle? Handle, right? Because if you push parallel to the door, not a lot's gonna happen because you don't have any torque. If you push perpendicular to the door, great, you're gonna have a lot more torque, okay? So that's all we really need to know about the dot and cross.